Hello everyone, FPL Raptor here and welcome back to another video on my YouTube channel. In today's video, I've got my top transfer targets ahead of game week 24 and beyond. I'm going to take a look at player touch maps, underlying statistics, fixture analysis, etc. It's going to be a very, very comprehensive video taking a look at lots of different players ahead of game week 24. If you're enjoying the content here on this channel, please do remember to like, comment and subscribe. We've still got a lot of content before the game week 24 deadline. We're going to have a game week preview video, team selection video and a live stream as well. So if you are enjoying the content and you've not yet subscribed, please do consider doing so down below. But without further ado, let's jump into today's video. Before we jump to today's video, I just want to give a massive shout out to Ultimate Champions, who will be sponsoring today's video. Ultimate Champions is the first free-to-earn fantasy football game powered by the blockchain. You essentially collect different forms of rare cards, which you can get through pack openings or by trading on the marketplace. You build the best, rarest squad you possibly can. And when that team does incredibly well in real life, as with fantasy football, you earn more points. And the more points you earn, the better the rewards. For the beta, which will be launching very, very soon, there will be championship teams, there will be League One teams, and there will also be Scottish teams and I know that the team are currently working to include further teams and further leagues for future versions of the game as well. So basically I think you should get onto this project as soon as possible. I will be playing this from the very start so as soon as this goes live I'll be playing, I'll be trading cards, I'll be opening packs as well and I'll be bringing you some content in and around that for the sponsorships for this video as well. So get on this as soon as possible. You, the way you can do that obviously because the game isn't quite live yet is you can join the Discord community, the link will be down below. If you do that you get the opportunity to earn some OG rolls and potentially some free packs. So do join the Discord community and I'll also leave their Twitter link down below as well. So you can follow them over on Twitter. You can turn on notifications so that you know when the game does go live and you can basically get on this project as soon as possible. So thank you to Ultimate Champions. Incredibly excited by the game and by this partnership. Let's jump to today's video. So the first comparison for today's video is between Luca Dean and Mark Cucurella. Now, I do really enjoy using the sort of battle stat graphics, and that's why I'm using them here today. But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's one or the other. For example, if I were on a wild card, I would probably be having both. And equally, it doesn't mean that one is necessarily much better than the other if I'm doing this. I just think it's nice because they're two players at similar prices, in this case, exactly the same price. And it's nice to see if you're considering bringing in Luca Dean, how does he compare to the likes of Cucurella? So for this first comparison, like I said, both 5.1 million pound defenders. I guess the reason that a lot of people are trying to decide Luca Dean or Cucurella, and I know this is quite a difficult decision, is if you think you've probably got Trent and Cancelo in your defense. I know a lot of people are looking to bring in Laporte as well. If you also have Dean and Cucurella in there, it starts to become quite expensive defense. I know a lot of people are maybe considering Robertson as well, and there are some other cheaper defenders in there as well. So I think for most people, it's likely to just be one sort of five million pound defender, and therefore they've got to make the decision between Luca Dean and Cucurella. So with respect to fixtures, Believe it or not, I think I actually prefer Aston Villa's fixtures just about, despite the fact that they do have the double game week Brighton in game week 25. If you consider the fact that Brighton's game week 25 double includes Manchester United. Now, I know Manchester United aren't fantastic, but the attack has still been pretty decent recently. Whether that be Bruno Ronaldo, whether it be Alanga, whether it be Rashford, whoever it may be, they do look like they have the potential to score. And even Watford, to some extent, they haven't been fantastic, no, but they do still have the talent there with King, Dennis, Ismail Assar coming back as well. So I don't think that's necessarily the most amazing double game week in the world. Outside of that, Burnley's a decent one. Villa have been scoring a few goals. Newcastle's a decent fixture. And Liverpool's a tricky fixture. So if you think 24 and 29 are pretty tricky, and I don't necessarily think 25 is the best double in the world, I still think that Brighton's fixture is fantastic, but I don't think that they're as amazing as potentially they look at the first glance. Whereas I do think Villa's are brilliant, specifically the next three for Villa. Leeds, Newcastle and Watford are all excellent fixtures. Like I said, Watford do have the potential to score goals and Leeds do have the likes of Rafinha, but I do still fancy a few clean sheets in there for Aston Villa. Game at 27 against Brighton. Brighton are obviously pretty poor in attack. 28 against Southampton's a decent enough fixture and then 29 you'd probably expect West Ham to score. I think what I would say is that both have a pretty nice next six fixtures, but I would just about lean toward Villa. The other reason I would lean towards picking a Villa player, specifically only looking at the fixtures, is they've still got Burnley at home and Leeds away to be rearranged at some point. 26 looks like it could be a time to get that rearranged into, and 28 and 29 both look like weeks where we could potentially get double game weeks. So... I think just about fixtures-wise, I would lean towards Luca Dean. Before we go into the individual underlying statistics, though, it is well and truly worth noting that Brighton are probably a top four defence. So we're looking at sort of like the fourth or fifth best defence in the Premier League, very similar to Wolves. And Aston Villa are definitely a bottom half table, even since Gerrard's taken over. And there is, th there is this narrative that since Gerrard has taken over, they're a brilliant defence. They're still in the bottom half of the table for expected goals conceded. So even with the newfound tightness and structure that I definitely think they've got with Gerrard, they're still not a fantastic defence, and Brighton are. 
So I suppose that probably counteracts the fact that I just about prefer Villa's fixtures and that Brighton are a fantastic defence. And if you're going for a player from a better defence, I think you do need to lean towards Cucurella here. So I guess it's a 50-50 court at the moment. So if we take a look at the underlying statistics, they've both played a fair amount of minutes. And it's worth noting again that most of Luca Dean's minutes have been played at Everton. And therefore, it's difficult to tell how he'll perform for Villa over a longer period. Projected points over the next six games, despite the fact that they do blank in 24, because they have that extra fixture in 25, the fantasy football fix algorithm still predicts Cucurella to score more points over the next six weeks. And again, that is likely due to the fact that Brighton's defence is significantly better than Aston Villa's. Expected FPL points per 90 across the season. Cucurella's sitting at about five, whereas Luca Dean is at 4.06. And again, that is because Cucurella's playing for the better defence. A lot of those expected FPL points are taken up through expected clean sheets. And it is worth taking into account how good Brighton's defence is. Non-penalty expected goals and expected assists, very, very similar. So 0.13 for Luca Dean, 0 0.11 for Cucurella. That hasn't massively increased for Luca Dean since being at Aston Villa. So again, early signs would be that he'd continue at the sort of rate that we've seen across the season. And 0.11 for Cucurella is very good. We also know that Cucurella, Luca Dean as well, but Cucurella in particular is a bonus points monster. Even when he doesn't keep a clean sheet or get an attacking return, he's still always very high up in bonus points. Big chances wise, neither of them have had a big chance this season. So you're pretty much picking them for either a crazy goal from outside the box or expected assists. So they're more creative options than they are goal threats. And then touches in the box, almost identical. 1.33 for Luca Dean, 1.36 for Cucurella. So I guess it probably comes down to a sort of a gut feeling call. And I know that's a bit of a cop-out answer here, but I essentially think that both of these are going to be incredible options over the next six weeks and across the remainder of the season as well. It largely comes down to who you fancy from your gut feeling and also do you need this player in game week 24? If you need the player in game week 24 or you'd like a defender in game week 24, maybe you've got like a Chelsea defender in there as well and you've got another player with a pretty difficult fixture and you want a third defender, it's got to be Luca Dean, of course, because Cucurella doesn't play. If you don't need this player in 24 and you've got a strong team, for example, I've got Cucurella already and he's sitting third sub for me and I just don't need him this week. I've got a perfectly fine team otherwise. Then maybe you bring in Cucurella because that... Double game week does obviously double the opportunity to score points. Burnley, Villa and Newcastle after that are fantastic fixtures as well. So if you don't need the player in 24, I really don't mind Cucurella. It comes down to whether you need the player and also your gut feeling as well. Let me know down below whether you prefer Luca Dean or Cucurella. If you are on wildcard, I genuinely think I might have a back five of Cancelo, Trent, Laporte, Dean and Cucurella. I know it's a lot of money invested into that defence, but they just all offer such fantastic value. I do think they could be brilliant over the remainder of the season. Right, we're going to move on to the big guns now. A bit of a comparison between Kevin De Bruyne and Bruno Fernandes. Now, this is a very, very tricky question to answer. I would argue in a similar fashion to how I just said with Luca Dean and Cucurella. I do think that there is definitely justification if you're on your wild card or even if you've got free transfers and money in the bank to have both of these until Salah's definitely back and maybe in, until he plays Norwich in 26 and then maybe move out De Bruyne for Salah in 26, then keep Bruno for Leeds and Watford. And then maybe after that, take out Bruno for like a Kane. So there's definitely justification to have two premiums at the moment, such as Bruno and De Bruyne, and then switch them out for Salah and Kane and maybe just start switching around the premiums a little bit more. We'll discuss that in the Game Week preview video. I'll give you my latest wildcard draft. And I do think that my latest wildcard draft will include two premiums for that very reason. I just think the premiums might start offering some good value once again. Of course, if Salah's back for game week 24 and we get confirmation of that, remember, he is going to play on the 6th no matter what now. It'll either be in the third place playoff or in the final of AFCON. He then plays on the 10th with Liverpool. So if we get some sort of confirmation, I don't think we will. But if we get confirmation, you're feeling confident enough that Salah will be back for game week 24, you might just want to go for Salah. But assuming that he's not or assuming that we're not definitely sure, I do think that De Bruyne and Fernandes are probably the best two premiums to own at the moment, specifically due to the fixtures. But they're also performing really well in their own right as well. If we take a look at the fixtures, I think it's largely irrelevant for Man City due to how good they are in the attack. Of course, they're the best attack in the league. or well, very similar to Liverpool, but since Salah and Mane have dropped to it, gone to AFCON, I do think that City have stepped it up since then, and they're starting to look like one of the best attacks in the league. So Liverpool and City, I think they're pretty much fixture-proof when you're looking at attacking assets. But even ha having said that, Brentford, Norwich and Everton in the next four are really, really good. Of course, Lampard might tighten them up in defence, but I don't necessarily think that's what Lampard's been brought in to do. But Brentford and Norwich, regardless, are two such nice fixtures. If De Bruyne plays against Brentford and Norwich, I think you're probably expecting close to double digits or at least double digits in both games there. Of course, he's got so many routes to points as well that I just think regardless of fixtures, you're going to want him. But with those fixtures, it makes him a fantastic choice. With Bruno Fernandes, I do think that the fixtures are better than... De Bruyne's, you've got Burnley away, Southampton and Brighton in 25, then Leeds in 26 and Watford in 27. 
a really important caveat and very, very something that's very noteworthy, I would say, is when are you going to want to bring... If you're only going for one of these, when are you going to want to bring Salah back in? Because if you want to bring Salah back in for game week 26 when Salah plays Norwich, I might go for De Bruyne. The reason for that is De Bruyne's got Brentford and Norwich and then Tottenham in 26. So that is almost like a natural time to switch from De Bruyne to Salah. If you bring in Bruno Fernandes... When he's got Leeds in 26 and Watford in 27, Salah, yes, has Norwich in 26, but Salah then blanks in game week 27. So unless you plan on playing your free hit in game week 27, you're probably not going to want to take Bruno out for Salah. In which case, then you're saying, well, I'm going to go without Salah for game until back game week 28, game week 29. And that means you miss the Salah game against Norwich. So it's almost like if you go for De Bruyne, you're, you're at least willing to take him out before Tottenham. If you go for Bruno, you're probably not willing to take him out before Leeds and Watford. That's not necessarily a bad thing. And you might say, well, I'd want Salah against Norwich anyway. But you are risking getting massively punished there with Bruno playing Leeds. And then you probably want Bruno back in in game week 27 anyway, because Liverpool blank. So definitely look ahead to game week 27. Are you going to play your free hit? Like I said, if you include both De Bruyne and Fernandes, you can just keep Fernandes until game week 28-ish when they play City and then Tottenham. And then you can switch De Bruyne out for Salah around game week 26. Sorry for rambling there, but I'm just thinking about sort of the logistics of how you're going to bring Salah back in if you're only going for one of these two premiums. With respect to underlying statistics, I would say De Bruyne across the season definitely comes out on top. You can see projected points as well over the next six fixtures. Despite the fact that Manchester United have an extra fixture in 25, the fancy football fix algorithm still prefers De Bruyne over the next six fixtures. Expected FPL points per 90, 6.06 for De Bruyne across the season, which is highly impressive. Even... Even Bruno's 5.11, considering he hasn't been in fantastic form across the season, that's still pretty good as well. Their non-penalty expected goal involvement is pretty much identical. 0.56 for De Bruyne, 0.53 for Bruno. And then big chances for Bruno. He is coming out on top, but neither of them are getting a lot. So Bruno's getting a big chance every three games or so. Kevin De Bruyne hasn't had a big chance this season. So again, he does occupy in and around the edge of the box, maybe whipping in some great crosses as well, but he's not getting those clear-cut opportunities in front of goal. Touches in the box, though. KDB is actually doing very, very well. 4.02. Considering he plays a lot in that number eight role, that is highly impressive. 2.64 for Bruno isn't great, but we know he has been playing a little bit deeper at points this season. So now that he's playing in that number 10 role, I do expect that to continue. Speaking of now that... Uh, now that Bruno is playing in that number 10 role, since Manchester United have switched to the 4-2-3-1 formation, which has only been three fixtures for Bruno, his non-penalty expected goal involvement is 0.99 per 90. So he's having an expected goal involvement of about one per game, which is a massive improvement on his 0.53. Now, there are a few things to note there. Number one, it could be due to the fact that we've switched back to a 4-2-3-1 because we know that's when Bruno is most effective. But number two... Ronaldo has had limited minutes in those games. So it's difficult to tell. Is it due to the formation that Bruno has been playing really well, i.e. playing in behind the striker? Or is it due to the fact that he's also been playing a lot of minutes when Ronaldo hasn't been in the team? So it's difficult to draw conclusions over such a small sample size. But what I would say is eye test would suggest that Bruno's back. Underlying statistics would suggest that he's made stark improvements, specifically in the 4-2-3-1. And therefore, if you're looking over recent fixtures, for example, De Bruyne's has been 0.46 over the last two games. So again, very small sample size, but it would look like De Bruyne is sort of maintaining that around 0.5 non-penalty expected goal involvement per 90, whereas Bruno is shot up massively. So it largely does depend on what sort of sample size you want to look at. But I think... I think, therefore, I might just about lean towards Bruno. I think that Bruno's starting to show signs of improvement. KDB is incredibly consistent. But when you also consider the double in game week 25, it would be a fantastic captaincy option. Yes, De Bruyne could be a captaincy option in game week 25, but you're never 100% sure that De Bruyne will start. Bruno's got two fixtures. I think I would just about, if you're only going to have one, I would just about, at the moment, lean towards Bruno. But De Bruyne is a fantastic option. As I said, if you can get both in your team, I think that would be excellent. Then you can switch De Bruyne out for Salah in game week 26. Let me know down below which of the two you prefer. Do you already own one? Are you looking to get both in? Or are you just going to go for Salah and hope that he's back? Or potentially you're going to be going for Kane and Ronaldo, two fantastic strikers at a premium price as well. So just to mix it up a bit and sort of break up the battle stat graphics, what I thought I'd do here is compare all of the really, really interesting 5.5 million pound-ish midfielders because there are a lot. Obviously, there have been also some signings in the January transfer window as well. And I wanted to sort of just compare them and see if there are any worth considering. Now, if you're interested in even cheaper midfielders, I did release a video where I looked at sort of the 4.5 million pound midfielders-ish alongside some of the cheap defenders and the cheap attackers. That was in my wildcard guide video, which I released last week. So either after this video, you can pause and go and watch that now if you're interested. I did discuss the real budget enablers. So if you're not interested in this sort of cheaper price and you want to go all the way down, definitely go watch that video. But here are 
I wanted to look at that slightly more expensive price around sort of between 5.3 and 5.7 million pound. So not quite pushing the likes of like a Gallagher, but not also going quite as low as the prices of sort of like a Ramsey or an Alanga. So we're starting with McAllister at 5.3 million. Of course, we discussed the fixture in the Cucurella section. The main reason you'd want McAllister is for that double in game week 25, but the fixtures are pretty decent anyway. Brighton aren't fantastic offensively. In fact, they actually really struggle. But I do think McAllister is one of the bright lights for them. You can see his non-penalty expected goal involvement is 0.35, which essentially means we're expecting him to get a goal involvement of some kind every three games, which isn't terrible for a 5.3 million pound midfielder. And it does mean in a double game week, he's probably a decent option. His expected FPL points per 90, taking into account obviously the expected clean sheet point that he gets for playing in midfield, is actually 5.68. And that's also because he did take a penalty as well. So he could potentially be on some penalties, gets the extra point for a clean sheet which Brighton do get quite often and they've got the best fixtures on this list looking at the fantasy football scout ticker so I really like McAllister as an option specifically if you don't need to play him in 24 and you want to target that game at 25 double I think he could be a fantastic option and I definitely think he's one of the better players on this list we've got Mbermo on here He's obviously a bit of a troll, but what we do like about Inbermo is he's pretty much nailed. You can see he's played the most minutes on the list here. You can see his non-penalty expected goal involvement. It's actually the joint second best on this list. So he is a decent goal threat. That's because he plays out of position up top. And his expected FPL points per 90 is 4.29, which is decent enough for a 5.3 million pound midfielder. The fixtures for Brentford are actually decent enough. They're 11th in the Premier League from an attacking perspective. So not bad fixtures either. And I do think we're going to discuss Ericsson in a minute, but if they do play that 3-5-2 formation, which we expect them to do, and Ericsson to play in behind Tony and Mbermo, I do think that could potentially increase the output of Mbermo and Tony. So I don't think he's a terrible option. He wouldn't be my first choice, but when the fixtures do improve from sort of game week around game week 28, game week 29 for Brentford, I do think Mbermo could be a fantastic option. And at 5.3 million, it's difficult to go wrong at that price. I think arguably the best pair on this is not even arguably, Definitely the best player on this list from an attacking perspective, you're looking at just the underlying statistics, is Martinelli. You can see almost six touches in the box per 90, highly impressive. His non-penalty expected goal involvement is by far and away the best on this list at 0.42. His non-expected goal involvement per 90 is 0.6. That is an elite standard. That's sort of what you'd expect from an eight or nine million pound midfielder. Expected FPL points per 90, the second best in this list at 5.95. The only issue you've got with Martinelli, and I don't even think it's game time. Obviously, they've Lost all Bamiang to Barcelona. They've not got a massive amount of squad depth up top. Yes, he could potentially be dropped out for Smith Rowe. I think game time will be fine for Martinelli. The real issue is the fixtures. Arsenal obviously blank in game week 25 and game week 27. They've got Wolves in game week 24. So they're not necessarily got the best fixtures. But in and around Wolves into two blanks, which of course is their next three, uh, three of their next four fixtures, I don't actually mind their fixtures overall. And what you need to consider is if you don't need to play Martinelli this week, which you might not when he's considering he's 5.4 million, this might be your fifth midfielder. If you don't need to play him this week and potentially you're considering playing your free hit in game week 27, then all you're looking at is, is a blank in game week 25. And you can get away with that. So... I don't mind the fixtures necessarily if you can get away with potentially either playing him against Wolves this week, which isn't the best fixture in the world, potentially benching him for the blank in 25. And then if you're free hitting in 27, when you sort of can navigate those fixtures, he is definitely the best option on this list. So definitely plan ahead, consider. And like I said, if you are considering free hitting or you can get away with benching him in those fixtures, I would argue that Martinelli is definitely the best choice there. The only reason the fixtures don't look great is because of those two blanks and because of the Wolves fixture as well. So I'll leave it there, but I think Martinelli is probably the best option on this list apart from those tricky fixtures. If you take into account fixtures and also underlying statistics, I'd argue that despite it being a small sample size, Michael Elise is probably the best option at 5.4 million pound. You can see touched in the box, decent at 3.90. His non-penalty expected goal involvement is very, very good. But what I would say... His, his expected goals are very low. So what that essentially means, if you're not particularly interested in underlying statistics, is that he's not a massive goal threat. So 0.12 is pretty poor, but his expected assist at 0.42 is highly impressive. He's very, very creative. He reminds me of a slightly worse version of Kevin De Bruyne when I take a look at his statistics. Similar amount of touch in the box, similar amount of expected goals in that it's not very high, but his expected assist is incredibly high. Very, very creative. Also, you can see his expected FPL points per 90 is the best on this list. The fixtures in the immediate term such as Norwich in game week 24 is fantastic for Michael Elise. The only thing that I would say is that his minutes aren't guaranteed. 
I do expect him to continue to start, but he's definitely prone to early substitutions and it's not beyond him to potentially be benched in a couple of these fixtures as well. So I think if you're willing to take a risk, and I think this is probably the place to take a risk, i.e. a cheap midfielder, I think Michael Elise could pro potentially be the best option on this list when you take into account everything. And especially if you do need the player in game week 24 and game week 25, 6, 7, etc. Whereas, of course, Martin Lee's got a couple of those blanks. So I'd say that arguably those are the two best options on this list, but for different reasons. Damari Gray... I think is a very steady option. It does largely depend on what formation Lampard wants to play. Lampard at points with Derby did play a 4-1-2-1-2 narrow, which it sounds like a very FIFA formation. But what that essentially means is you've got four central midfielders, such as a Decore, Allen, Van Der Beek and Deli Alley, And then you can play two up top with Richarlison and Calvert-Lewin. So he has been known to play that formation in the past. And signing both Van Der Beek and Deli Alley does suggest that he might want to fill out that midfield. If that is the case, Damari Gray either plays up top alongside... Calvert-Lewin, or I would expect Richarlison plays that role and Damari Gray could drop onto the bench. Assuming he does keep his place and maybe Lampard plays a 4-3-3 with Van Der Beek and Deli Alli both playing the number eight role and Decore holding or Allen holding, I do think that he could be a decent option. 0.31 expected goal involvement per 90 is not great and he's not getting that many touches in the box comparison to the likes of Martinelli. But I do still think he's a decent option, and I think he'll probably tick along nicely. And what you like with Gray is if they do play with a wide formation, he's going to play every minute because he's definitely their best winger. So I might wait on Gray just a little bit just to assess what formation Lampard wants to play. I already own Gray. I'm perfectly happy holding him and waiting to see if they play with a wide formation. But I think maybe you might want to target some other players for the time being. I've got Ericsson on this list, as you can see by the little asterisk. This is from his 2021 season in the Serie A, because obviously he's not played any minutes this season in the Serie A. Decent enough underlying statistics, but not mind-blown. And I definitely think Ericsson, for me, is a wait and see, despite the fact that I think 5.5 million is a great price. You can see his expected assist per 90 are very good, but he's not a massive goal threat. And it's difficult to assess how good he's going to be in that Brentford team. We don't know what role he's going to play. Is he going to play number 10? Is he going to play a number 8 role? How many minutes can he play with, obviously, his condition? And also the fact that he's just not got match fitness. So I think Ericsson's definitely a wait and see, but I would definitely keep your eye on him because I think he'll be a fantastic option. Van der Beek's a very similar one for me. He's only played sort of 59 or 69 minutes so far in the Premier League this season. So I've taken the statistics from the previous season when he played, I don't think that's correct, 1,250. I think he's played about sort of 500, 600 minutes he played in the season last, last year. But when he did play, and again, it was limited minutes and often from the bench, he often looked really good. 4.74 touched in the box per 90 puts him the third best on this list. So when he does play, he plays quite an attacking role. And obviously it does depend what role he plays for Everton. Again, similar to Ericsson, not got great expected goals, but he has got pretty decent expected assists as well. So I expect Ericsson and Van Der Beek to play very similar roles in the team for Brentford and Everton respectively. And I expect them to both be pretty good creative forces. You can see he's expected FPL points per 90 with 4.84 as well. So I think Van Der Beek and Ericsson are both wait and see due to lack of match fitness and also not knowing how they're going to settle into the side and what role they're going to play. Will it be slightly deeper? Will it be right in behind the strikers? We just don't know at this stage, but both of them could be great great prices for the back end of the season. And I've just chucked his Mila Sarr in there as well. Obviously, we'll be returning from AFCON. We haven't seen a lot of him recently due to picking up an injury and then going off to AFCON as well. But at 5.7 million, he's definitely worth considering with the fact that Watford have fixtures to be rearranged. And when he, before he went away to AFCON, before his injury, he was potentially on penalties and he did look pretty decent as well early on in the season. You can see second highest touch in the box per 90, second high, or joint second highest non-penalty expected goals per 90. So I don't think he's necessarily the best option on this list. And due to match fitness and also just coming back into the Watford side, he is probably a wait and see once again, but definitely one to monitor as well. So I would argue that both the bottom four, Gray, Eriksen, Van Der Beek and Saar, are probably all wait and see options because we don't know how they'll play under either new management or coming into a new team. I would argue that Mbermo is a decent enough price, but I'm not necessarily sure that I would want to go for him just because his end product has been so poor. And again, I'd like to see how he starts to link up with Ericsson and maybe go for him from game week 25 onwards when there's some nice fixtures or maybe wait until around game week 28, game week 29 when the fixtures turn again for Brentford, which leaves probably my top three options would be McAllister, Martinelli and Elise. So if, if I were choosing, I would choose from those three. It largely depends. Do you need your player in game week 24? in which case you have to have to go with Martinelli or Elise. Do you need them in 25? In which case you don't go for Martinelli, you go for McAllister. So rather than just specifically focusing on underlying statistics, I'd plan your team ahead, plan the rotations. And in doing so, one of these will probably come out as a very decent option. I would just keep an eye on Elise's minutes because I think out of Elise, Martinelli, McAllister, Elise is probably the highest minutes risk here. Let me know down below, are you considering any midfielders in and around this price? If you are, which ones stand out to you? If I had to choose right now, 
I think I might take a punt on Elise, but I do like the double for McAllister as well. So back to the player battle statistics. The next comparison that I'm going to make is between Emilio Buendia and Conor Gallagher. Now, Buendia doesn't score very often and he hasn't been massively in the points, but he did score 10 points in game at 23. And as a result, I think he'll be in a few people's minds. The fixtures are fantastic coming up. So I wanted to look at the underlying statistics and see, was that a fluke? Do the underlying statistics support the fact that he might continue to play fairly well? Or should we just go for someone safer like Conor Gallagher, who's been performing very, very well all season? There is, of course, the argument to be made that you either go cheaper with the players that we've just mentioned all the way cheaper with the likes of Ramsey or potentially Jakob Moda, or you just go up a little bit and go for a safe option in someone like Rafinha. I'll be honest, I think Rafinha might be worth the extra money that you pay over Wendy and Gallagher, but just in case you can't spread to those, or you just want to go for a slightly cheaper option, or potentially you own Rafinha already, I thought this would make for a nice comparison. Of course, we've discussed the Villa fixtures, brilliant fixtures up until game week 29. They've also got two really nice fixtures to be rearranged as well. Conor Gallagher's also got very, very decent fixtures, and we discussed that in the Elise section as well. Norwich and Brentford in 24 and 25 are great. Chelsea in 26 isn't ideal, but Burnley in 27 is really nice. And I'll tell you the other reason why I like Gallagher to have that great fixture in 27 is that if you're not playing your free hit in 27, it means that you'll likely lose Salah, Trent and Jota, or Salah, Robertson and Trent, whoever it may be. And you might also have some Arsenal players as well, in which case all of the players that you have in your team, you'll need to be playing and you'll hopefully have good fixtures as well so the fact that Gallagher's got such a nice fixture in game at 27 I really like that and also they've got that Watford game to be rearranged as well so I think the fixtures are actually really nice for for Crystal Palace nice fixture to be rearranged but what I would say is 26 27 and 28 aren't only not very good fixtures they're very terrible fixtures specifically Chelsea Wolves and City have three of the best defenses in the league so I don't really like those fixtures in particular but the other three are fantastic so fixtures wise I would still lean towards Villa but I do like Crystal Palace is at least over the next four weeks in particular. When we take a look at the underlying statistics, Gallagher does come out on top on every single underlying statistic, but they're not necessarily massive. It's definitely a difference, but it's not probably a significant difference between the two. Projected points, the Fantasy Football Fix algorithm predicts that Gallagher will score an extra six or so points over the next six game weeks, which works out an extra point a week. So that's not an incredible amount, but it is definitely significant across the remainder of the season. Expected FPL points per 90, 5.16 for Gallagher is very decent. 4.33 for Buendia is decent enough for a 6.2 million pound midfielder. Non-penalty expected goal involvement. Gallagher's actually isn't that great across the season and it continues to sort of drop off and plateau. At, earlier on in the season, it was sort of about a 0 0.8, 0 0.9. I remember mentioning him in around game week, sort of five game week six. Gallagher was outperforming most of the premium players, but that has dropped down to what you would say is a very average statistic for a 6.1 million pound midfielder. It was 0 0.44. It's not terrible. It's pretty decent, but it's also not great. Buendia's is even worse at 0 0.33. And that would suggest to me that Buendi is probably not going to maintain the rate of scoring every game or assisting every game. You're likely going to get a return every few games. That being said, Leeds, Newcastle and Watford are sort of the fixtures you would expect returns and he might pick up two or three returns in those games. I wouldn't put it past him and he definitely looks like he's playing very, very well, very well under Gerrard. I've definitely seen improvements at least through the eye test anyway, but that's not a massive difference between the two. 0 0.11 isn't a huge difference across six games. That's only a 0.66 difference in expected goal involvement. So if you fancy Buendia and you think the fixtures are great and you think he's passing the eye test, I don't necessarily mind him over Gallagher. Where there is quite a big difference is Buendia just isn't getting any big chances. His expected goals are also quite low, whereas Gallagher's getting 0.38 big chances per 90 and his expected goals are actually pretty decent. So with Gallagher, you're getting a bit of assist threat. You're getting also some goal threat as well. With Wendy, you're probably relying on an absolute screamer, as you probably are with Coutinho as well, or you're relying on that expected assist creativity. Touches in the box, very, very close. They're both getting around three touches in the box per 90. Their touch maps are fairly similar. Gallagher getting more touches on the right, where a lot of Wendy's touches are central. I think I would still lean to Gallagher out of the two, but I don't mind Wendy. His stats aren't terrible, but they're definitely not mind-blowing by any means. As I said, I think I would probably go for Rafinha. Might still be on penalties even when Bamford is back and Click is back. But in and around that, we just know he's going to play 90 minutes. The fixtures are decent enough over the next sort of six to 10 weeks. And he, like I said, he's a glue guy. You can just keep him in your team for the, rem for the remainder of the season. You know you can rely on him to tick along. So I would argue that Rafinha might be a better option out of the two. But if you want to go a little bit cheap and you want to target the fixture specifically, I like Buendia and Gallagher. Let me know down below. Are you considering Buendia? Do you already own Gallagher? Or are you just going to go for the cheaper options in like a Ramsey or Moda? Or are you just going to go for the safer option in Rafinha? Let me know in the comments.
So the final comparison for today's video is between Odds on Edouard and Neil Mopé. Now we've already discussed Palace's fixtures and Brighton's fixtures as well. We've not made a direct comparison between the two. And I would say that assuming that you can get away with benching Mopé in 24 or just wait until 25, I do prefer Brighton's fixtures. Palace have the slightly better attacking output than Brighton, but I don't think either of these teams have fantastic attacks and you are relying on probably the odd return here and there rather than expecting these two to suddenly explode. With respect to the underlying statistics between the two, they do slightly lean towards Odds and Edward. Now, the only thing that I would say before we dive directly into looking at them specifically, the thing that you've got with Mope is that he's likely to play 90 minutes every game, or he's definitely expected to get more minutes than Edward. And I think that's a very similar comparison. If you're trying to choose between Elise and McAllister, I think you've got a very similar comparison there. Elise's underlying statistics are better, but McAllister is definitely nailed in that team or will definitely play more minutes, I would say. Whereas Edward has slightly better underlying statistics again, but Mope is definitely more nailed in that Brighton side. So it depends your sort of risk reward appetite. I definitely think that the risk, it might be worth the risk going for a Palace player, but for the double game, we can also for security of having their place in the team, Mope and McAllister are probably the safer options. Looking at the underlying statistics, Mope is predicted to get the most points over the next six game weeks. That is likely due to the amount of minutes he's expected to get, whereas Edouard definitely don't, doesn't have nailed minutes in that team, or I wouldn't say so at least. I don't like to say definitely. I, I know I say it too often. Edouard's unlikely to get nailed minutes in that team. Expected FPL points, though. Edouard is coming out on top at 5.25 versus Mopay's 4.47. Non-penalty expected goal involvement is pretty decent, I guess, for two sort of cheaper strikers. 0.48 for Edward, 0.40 for Mope. When you take into account the fact that Edward's unlikely to get 90 minutes though, Mope probably shoots just above him because he's not going to get those 90 minutes to get that 0.48 expected goal involvement. So that is something to bear in mind as well. Big chances per 90 again, Edward at 0.77, Mope at 0.54. When you reduce Edward's minutes down to what he'll probably get around 60, 70 minutes, then again, they're probably fairly similar there. And touches in the box per 90, Edward is out on top, but only just. Again, if you reduce that for minutes, I'd say they're probably fairly similar. So Edward's definitely, if he plays 90 minutes, the bigger goal threat, got the better underlying statistics and has decent fixtures as well. But when you take into account the fact that I don't expect him to play 90 minutes every game, whereas Mopay does tend to, also the fact that Mopay has that double game, we can game at 25 when he's a great option against Watford and Manchester United. If you don't have a captaincy option, I guess you could try and captain Mopay. But I just think generally speaking, I think I would just about lean to Edward. The reason for that is I just think that if he plays 90 minutes and he does nail down a place and he does continue to look good, which he has, I think he's the slightly more exciting pick and it might be worth the risk going for him. But as a content creator, if I'm suggesting the most logical, sensible decision for you, I do think that Mopay is probably the one due to Game Week 25, due to nailed minutes. I just think that when I'm going for that sort of risky third spot that I don't mind moving around, I think I'd like the sort of Edouard Elise pick. The final thing I would say is that if you're going for a, a cheaper striker and a cheaper midfielder, I probably wouldn't double up on the risk of Edouard and Elise. I would go for like a Mopay and Elise, or I would go for an Edouard and McAllister. And I think in doing so, you're spreading the risk a little bit and you're not putting all of your eggs in one basket with those Crystal Palace attackers who might not even get 90 minutes combined between them in one game. So that's my opinion. Let me know down below. Are you considering Edouard or Mopay? Are you going to take the risk of Edouard's minutes or are you going to go safer with Mopay? Or are there any other cheaper strikers you like, potentially like a Broya or an Ida? Very, very interested to hear your thoughts down below. So guys, there you have it. Those are my Game Week 24 top transfer targets. Some of them more suitable for Game Week 25 and beyond, but because I don't do these video videos very often, I thought I'd discuss some players that are good for not only this immediate fixture in Game Week 24, but also future fixtures as well. Let me down below if you like these transfer targets videos. I do a very similar thing for Fantasy Football Fix each week, but due to the deadlines, I normally don't have time to get out all these different videos. But before Game Week 24 deadline, we've still got a team selection video, we've still got a Game Week preview video, and we've still got a probable live stream as well. So if you're still watching this and you haven't subscribed, do subscribe, turn on that notification bell so you know when all these different videos go live and you know when I start streaming as well. But until next time, guys, thank you so much for watching. Cheers. Bye-bye.